thank you all for for uh, chiming in, uh, ask questions at any point in time. Um, the What we've done in our community, the East Texas Human Needs Network is actually not a direct service provider except for the getting ahead classes. Everything else that we do is working with organizations uh, on collective impact, on research. It's all about poverty. And then uh, we teach many of the programs that AHA process has in place. One of the things that we identified was that we had uh, an unsheltered homeless community that was not, uh, didn't have access to care. And I was asked by the health department to develop a homelessness response plan. And knowing what we already knew about our community and then including what the CDC guidelines had already posted, we developed a plan that was very comprehensive, taking into account how to address the needs of people who are sheltered uh, and people who are in encampments. But most importantly, how do we take care of those people who are not sheltered, who have pre-existing conditions that put them at greater risk of complications if they were to be infected by COVID-19? Um, we started with on April 6th under a busy bridge in Tyler, Texas, where we found a gentleman with stage four congestive heart failure, um, severe rheumatoid arthritis. He'd been laying on that mattress without medication for five days, which was the time when he was released from the hospital. The hospital actually released him by putting him on a taxi and taking him under the bridge. It's heartbreaking and it's an issue that we're going to be addressing. But for now, we needed just to take the step forward and, and start helping that community. Well, since that day, we've been able to identify 24 different individuals. When we meet with them, we use the CDC's app for screening. And that screen tells you, one, call 911, two, teach them how to isolate safely, how to do this distancing safely, even if you're in an encampment or on the streets. Um, three is isolation as soon as possible, and four is isolation and testing. So for the first three weeks, two weeks, three weeks, it's all running together, um, we were housing individuals who had not been exposed, but who were at risk of complications in one hotel. And in the last three days, we've identified families that had been exposed, that had been to the hospital, the hospital had released them to the Salvation Army to congregate housing, which really scared all of us. The possibility that 140 people at the Salvation Army may have been exposed. Um, but we've taken those two young families and put them in a separate hotel. Since then, we've identified two other families. So we have two hotels, one for protecting individuals who haven't been exposed, but who are at high risk of complications. And now the second hotel, which is for placing people that have been exposed, that are showing symptoms, that have been tested, and who are awaiting uh, results. Um, we've posted little videos, kind of like I'm doing right now, telling the story on Facebook. We started a fundraising campaign and we're raising funds. We have amazing partners in the community. So everything from food that people could prepare in their little kitchenettes to meals that are being provided daily, clothing, uh, case management, including connecting them with doctors, um, getting them their medications or any equipment that they need. Uh, we have several uh, pregnant uh, moms in our program. And in fact, one had a baby yesterday. Uh, so we have our first COVID-19 isolation housing baby. Uh, he was born yesterday and he and mom are both healthy. Um, it's been both heartbreaking and enlightening. Um, it's been wonderful to see a community that is stepping up and doing what they can. It's also been pretty ugly to see those that perhaps should be doing something and stepping up and who may have even the means to do so and are choosing not to. So we are, we've decided to focus on the positive to help as many people as possible uh, and to address and perhaps hold people accountable after this passes. So that's where we are right now and I'm happy to answer any questions that you guys might have. That that is fabulous, and I follow East Texas Human Needs on um, Facebook, and saw a picture of that sweet little baby uh, from mm -hmm. 
day. So mm-hmm. um, anybody that, you know, we need to follow each other on Facebook with if you have a Bridges community and, and they are East Texas Human Needs and you can follow them on Facebook to see their postings and what they're doing. But anybody have questions for Christina? I did mute um, you guys while she was speaking. So please open up your minds. What kind of, um, you know, challenges or whatever. But Katie, I see you're open. What question do you have? Um, I guess as uh, since what you do is... Um, partner with other organizations it seems like that is a real strength that you that you have and that you're still working that how do how do you develop those kind of partnerships it has been a long time coming um we've been the east texas human needs network in place for seven years now and i think the way in which we stay connected is that over 100 organizations are working together and it's everything from a taxi cab company to a to a shelter to a junior college or to a food pantry what we all have in common is that we're helping others and that we're doing it in various ways, but that's really what we have in common. So we stay connected, we meet regularly, we learn more about each other. Uh, It's easier than when you interact with somebody who has needs that you cannot meet, that you actually know who to call. You pick up the phone and you say, uh, hey, Valerie, who is a pediatrician, we've just housed a young boy with asthma and who has been exposed to COVID. How can you help us? And people are stepping up and helping. Very nice. How often do you meet? We've been meeting every month. The first time that we missed was March. We're missing April in the last seven years. The first two times we've missed meeting. Yeah. And did you see how many partners you have? There are over 100 partner organizations, but at every meeting we have anywhere between maybe 50 and 80. It depends on what topic we happen to have on the agenda or what activities are coming up soon. Uh, We also developed an online social services directory um, Mm -hmm. made up of the partners and they themselves um, enter all of their data to ensure that it's accurate. We ask them that they write or that they describe their programs and services in the language of their clients so that it's accessible in many ways, not just is it easy to use online, but uh, will the people that we care about understand the way which we've described our programs. Okay, very nice. Thank you. Uh, And would you put, Christina, would you put that website on the chat? I will. Yeah. Um, The directory uh, 903health.org, that happens to be the area code in our community, 903. Mm -hmm. Um, And then our website, uh, ethnn.org and on that page you'll find the collective impact work that we do the research that we do every three years um, the the data that we gather is not from service providers but it's from uh, the the under-resourced community we we interview them directly to find out what their greatest needs are so collectively we then determine what are the greatest needs in education, employment, health, housing, and transportation. And we have councils dedicated to each of those areas of study. So every three years we do research and then in the interim, all these organizations are working on addressing what our clients tell us are the top needs in the community. Nora, did you have a question? Actually, um, I did. I was I was really hurt by the story of the man being put in a taxi from the hospital and taken under the bridge. Um, What kind of efforts can be made or have you already made um, with hospitals so that, I mean, I realize they're homeless, they don't know where they should go, but what can we do rather than put someone under a bus, under a bridge? Right. So part of the issue in our community is that we don't have a full continuum of care to address housing and homelessness. Uh, And in the absence of that continuum of care, often there are no clear solutions. And in this case, this gentleman could not go to the one shelter we have, the Salvation Army, because um, Salvation Army requires that you're able to care for yourself. Uh, And they also do not allow another uh, resident 
to take care of someone. It's those are the guidelines that they have. I understand why they're there. Um, there was no place for him to go. Now, when we drafted the homelessness response plan, which we hope is now the catalyst for uh, for bringing into our community some of the services that have been lacking. So we think this is a great spotlight and that we're going to be able to do a lot with what is happening right now. Uh, when we developed the homelessness response plan, we shared it with emergency operations. Hospitals are part of that network. They were supposed to have added to their discharge protocols, both in emergency departments and at the hospital, um, a screening for homelessness. And that if someone is homeless and is not related to COVID, that they would be released to Salvation Army um, if Salvation Army guidelines uh, would accept them. Uh, but if it was COVID related, that they would instead reach out to, to us, to our homeless response team, and that we would place them in isolation housing. Sadly, um, I've seen the last three days people that are being released either to the streets or a shelter that should not have been. So although the, we try to put those guidelines in place, it doesn't appear that uh, they have been adopted by the hospitals during the discharge process. Who else on this phone call could answer that question with what's happening in their communities? Um, unmute yourself or I see a few people have raised their hands and so i'm going to unmute you maybe mm -hmm. um kimberly I, I i can't unmute you so alisa alicia ashley kimberly phil please unmute yourself and um and if anybody wants to respond to that william is, is everybody I guess, I guess while we wait for people to arrive at some questions i could add a, a little bit to this um my my greatest angst or heartache at this point is um the guideline that i set up was as long as we have a stay-at-home order we will continue to identify people and isolate them mm -hmm. um, in the absence of the stay at home order, I still need to have a plan for individuals for whom we don't yet have services in this community. So that's my biggest worry. Um, there are some that truly need long term supportive housing that doesn't exist in this community. So we're having conversations with them about the possibility of moving to Austin or Houston or Dallas to go to long-term housing programs uh, and that's a difficult decision for them and then many of them qualify for benefits um, for disability benefits for example um, and they've been denied time and time again so we have a team of um, of preparers of people who do disability benefits uh, working with them there are three people in particular that i that i think about out of the 24 that when this stay at home is lifted and things settle i can't just let go to the streets and so we're having to put together a plan b um, and it may be that we actually keep them where they are continue to raise funds until they have a source of income even if it's disability and or we have found a, a place for them because putting them back out on the streets would mean uh, that they would die soon there's just no other way around. It's very clear based on their conditions, um, their inability to take advantage of existing programs, that if we just let them go, they wouldn't survive. So that's that's my biggest worry. It's something that can't be overcome overnight. You can't develop those types of comprehensive programs that quickly, um, but we're doing the best we can. So uh, Christina, this is Phil. I noticed at the end of your opening remarks, one of the last things you said was that some people would be held accountable. Yes. You want to expand on that? Um, the CDC guidelines um, that I followed um, describe what I already know to be true and effective is collective action and collective impact work. And it highlights the role that the health department, that the local government and county government play. Um, I've also done the research and found that, that they have access to funds 
through the CARES Act for CDBG CARES, through FEMA, uh, through the Health Department, uh, FEMA Schedule B. Um, I've shared all this information with them. They, they're not stepping up. And I've decided instead of uh, highlighting some bad press, I needed to focus on doing the right thing for now. But that doesn't mean that I'm not going to go back to them and, uh, and demand that they take action. If you've been funded for non-congregate isolation housing, or if you have access to funds for non-congregate isolation housing, it is an absolute tragedy that we would be fundraising and taking money from other nonprofits that need it desperately. So for now, you can sense the little anger. <laughs> I'm trying really hard to keep it down. Um, for now, we're going to focus on doing the right thing, um, but I'm keeping everything well documented and I'm going to go back to those organizations and uh, and demand that they do the right thing. Well, I congratulate you for that. I think it's wise not to do it right away, but, um, you know, we have to have those things are in place and people have to perform, right? Right. And uh, you guys know Mike well but not everybody in the audience does, but I know that Phil and Ruth and Jean do. Um, what he said to me is, if we don't hold them accountable in the end, then we're continuing to condone the behavior of this particular community, which is they don't step up to help those that are in need. They just push everything down to the nonprofit sector, even though through their capacity, we could do so much more. So Mike was right. Um, we do need to go back to them and hold them accountable, but I'm still focusing on let's take care of people first. Let's keep things well documented and then let's go to them after this passes. Um, so I have tried to unmute some of you and it says you're self muted. So please, if you want to talk, please try to unmute and let me know in the questions box if that's not working. Um, Christina a question from Jean Krebs is and and Christina is in Tyler, Texas, big oil and gas. Oil prices have collapsed due to the Saudi-Russian battle and the COVID downturn. How has this impacted the ability for advocates to raise money for their programs in your foundations? We, we are hearing from many of our uh, nonprofit partners that some of the people that they've relied on in the past to, to step up in difficult times aren't able to give at the level that they've given in the past. I, I think that people are still being as generous as they can, but they're cautious because so many people have lost so much. I mean, the, the wealthy have lost a tremendous amount of, of um, assets that they had, and so they're scared. Um, many businesses are closing down. Um, it, and it seems though, however, and you guys know this very well, that those that have the least to give are the first to step up and share. Um, and we continue to see that is true uh, right now. Yeah. All right. Other questions um, for your community specifically that you would like to ask the group? Ashley, I'm still muted, but that's okay. My dog keeps barking. <laughs> well, when <laughs> I click on you, Ashley, there you're open. Your mic is open, Ashley. Hey, can you hear me? Yes. Hi. Hi. So, were you? I'm. I'm sorry. I was trying to figure out the unmuting thing. Were you trying to get us to talk about what's going on in our communities, or questions that we have for her and her community? Either way, yeah. you know the Both. topic today: real problems, real solutions during COVID. So. If you have a real problem that's unsolved, let's bring it to the group. If you have a question for Christina, that's great. Oh, so no, I I was just gonna comment, which I'm sure LeVar, he's in Dayton area and I'm in like Hamilton, Cincinnati area, but I was just gonna say that our community has really like stepped up, like the people that are in homeless shelters, the shelters are paying for like, individual hotel rooms and like providing meals every day and like schools delivering I mean I'm just like I'm blown away by like the people that have come out of the woodworks to like that you didn't know even existed or organizations that existed to like 
over source, you know, those that are suffering or the healthcare workers, you know, getting free hotel rooms so they can quarantine away from their families, you know, yada, yada, yada. I'm just like, it just hurts my heart so much to know that her community is struggling by taking people, you know, to like under a bridge rather than like trying to find something more sustainable in the moment for that person. I mean, they're a human being, you know what I mean? So. Right. Yeah, it is heartbreaking. But yeah, right now we are, that's, that's what we're doing. The isolation housing is, is in hotels and two separate hotels now. Um, the one that would accept people that have been exposed um, or showing symptoms or a positive is a hotel that didn't have a kitchenette. So it's made it a little more challenging for us, oh, but, but yeah. we're stepping up and uh, we have, we're having meals delivered um, three times a day. Our numbers are small compared to other communities. Our numbers are small. Uh, I'm fortunate that every time there is a need and we started screening by going to the encampments and going to the shelter, going to the meal sites and going to the places where people can take showers. That Those are the places that we went to to start. And, and now we're at a point where I'm actually receiving calls from other providers. We had somebody from the mental health authority call me yesterday and said that one of their clients had been tested with the swab, had had the chest x-ray and the blood work, and he was given a letter with an order from our county judge to, to isolate himself. And he was homeless and they put him out on the street. So hmm. if it hadn't been for that mental health provider knowing that we had this program, he would still be on the street. And instead last night, he had a place to stay. That's awesome. Yeah. Thank you for your work there. Oh, you're welcome. You know, it's, it's never been more true that we're all in this together. It's, it's so absolutely true. It's, it seemed almost trivial initially, but the more I think about it and every day that progresses, the more I recognize just how true that is. Okay. Um, let me see. I'm not unable to uh, mute you, William, but do you have a question? It says you are self-muted. There we go. Welcome, William. We can, I have your line open. But we can't hear you. Anybody else with a question or a comment? Our goal each week is to give you information that you need um, in your community, in your organization during this period of COVID while we're looking at uh, doing things really differently. If you haven't looked um, at our blogs on ahaprocess.com under, under uh, well, the blogs, uh, Phil and Stephen, McDonald, Heidi, Jones, and another posted an article about post-COVID um, that I encourage you to look at to see um, how that might operate in your community. Um, anybody else? Anything else you want to say, Christina? Christina, like she says, they've been at this for, for seven years, and I had the opportunity of being at their uh, local conference, annual conference this year, where they um, uh, resulted from what she said, what people were telling them they need to concentrate on and what to do. You want to talk a little bit about that, Christina? Um, this year's summit in January was, was wonderful because we were able to bring on board uh, consultants from, um, from AHA Process for pretty much every sector. We had the consultant that wrote the book or is actually doing the work, and we invited our community to come to understand 
uh, bridges out of poverty, not just the needs. So we had research, we could give them the research and the data that said these are the top needs in the community. But we also were able to provide things to AHA process. You know, this is how you address poverty in um, the getting ahead while getting out or workplace stability or tactical communications or um, health and healthcare. Um, and so people in each of those areas of work were able to come and learn more about more about bridges, more about getting ahead. Okay. It was great. It was fun. Great. Uh, let me just change to gears just a little bit. How are your getting ahead classes going? Me? You're asking me? Are or everybody? Everybody. Right yeah. Question for everybody. Um, at, in Tyler, we don't have an active class right now. But we have had uh, many, I think we have 96 grads right now. Um, and they've become amazing advocates. Some of them are now members of the East Texas Human Needs Network. And so we try to get um, an advocate, an investigator into each of our councils so that as the nonprofit sector um, develops solutions to the problems that were shared with us that we have somebody with real life perspective to say, well, this is the reason why that might not work. Um, so our getting ahead is going well. And now we are waiting for school to start because our getting ahead uh, program uh, is being implemented uh, with Head Start. We're having Head Start um, classes and oh, and getting ahead also for some of the family service workers at Head Start. So different programs, but all part of the Title I uh, school district. Um, so that's exciting. We, we were excited to get that started and we've had to put it on hold, but we'll do that soon. Yeah. So William, I see your question, but I see Ed Spencer. Ed Spencer. So Ed, what's your question? Well, it has to do with getting ahead uh, in the current circumstance. Um, Christina, do you or anybody else have any wisdom or any uh, practical advice to how to do getting ahead either as part of a webinar or uh, with a Zoom call? How to keep it going, how to, yeah. How do you do it in the current environment? How about that? Just a general question. So, so we were fortunate not to actually have an active class. Um, and so I'm hoping somebody else in the in the group can step up. Yeah. But I'm thinking Zoom probably would would be very helpful. Yeah, we um we are using uh, Zoom and an app called Life Size um, because the free Zoom is only limited to like 40 minutes, but uh, Life Size is like unlimited for 90 minutes. Um, so my coworker and I. I'm doing the Zoom call because my normal class was only two hours a week and his normal class was four hours twice a week. So he uses the life size app. So they do the 90 minutes. Then he tells everyone, you know, to log off and eat lunch or take a break and then to log back on. And the same with me. Um, it's actually, so <laughs> I was telling my supervisor yesterday that even with these circumstances, like I've never had an in-person class where every single person had their homework completed, you know, like someone's like, oh, I forgot it. Or, you know, I didn't have time. And I'm like, we talked about this, but um, I don't know if it's that they're working, like they're really thinking because they have that time. Like I need resources and I need to learn, you know, this stuff, but every single week they have all of their homework done they're having like lots of questions they're even like facetiming each other with homework mm -hmm. um i've done uh like one-on-one -on -one meetings to work on their smart goals to, like zoom wise you know and so they can see me and i can see them and it's actually like i'm like why didn't we ever do this before for people who like didn't have transportation you know we could like yeah. turn on a computer and have them like sign in and like you know be in the room but not be in the room if that makes sense um in person so mm -hmm. for us i think and we we actually had a my coworker had a graduation like via life size app so they even graduated and they were mm -hmm. mailed their they're mailed their gifts gift cards every week they sign a piece of paper and then they send that back um we include like a stamp and an envelope 
and then they got their certificates mailed to them. So cool. I think it's been yeah. really awesome. It's wonderful. Especially, especially for the people who are like, I have an older lady and then another lady who has like two, she has twins, but they're both like considered medically fragile. So, mm -hmm. um, without him being in school or daycare, she wouldn't have been able to come to class anyways. And then she was just really excited that we did the Zoom so she could still be a part of it, but like not have to take her son anywhere, you know, to um, expose him, so. Can I ask who's speaking so that I can get in touch with you? <laughs> oh, um, this is Ashley Davidson. I work at um, an organization in Ohio called Supports to Encourage Low-Income Families. I can um, put my email in the questions. Would that work? Yeah. Or can everybody see yeah. that? Or I don't, I, I, I don't have a chat box on my screen. Oh, um, could hey, you get it to him, Ruth? Or? I can. Yeah, would you, okay. Thank you, Ruth. Thank yeah. you. And, and the last two weeks, we've had fabulous conversations with uh, communities using um, getting ahead and so if you go to our aha process youtube channel and look up the bridges calls you'll find those and you can listen to those but we have some of those people on the sure. phone kimberly talk about what you're doing hi so i'm kim with pueblo <clears throat> um i just started um, a new getting ahead class and so we had had no interaction before the class that was brand new first time on zoom um I'll admit I was a little concerned at first because you know so much of this is building relationships. But um, I have 11 attendees um, or investigators, and I have to tell you, I'm really impressed with this group. Um, some of them have to sit in their car, some of them are on their phone, some are on their computer. Um, as a matter of fact, two of the ones that that I was kind of nervous about um, that were really hesitant, sometimes I have to be careful that they don't take over the conversation because everyone is just really meshing well. Mm -hmm. um, one of the ladies didn't think this was going to be for her. She was real concerned about being on the camera, all this stuff. She actually did all of her homework because I'm recording the sessions after we do our initial um what's new or what's different or some people call them highs and lows whatever I, I i do all that just privately and then i tell them when i'm going to start recording but i also let them know that i don't share this with anyone it's just for those who missed a class so they can do their homework so um i'm sending those recordings to the ones that missed sessions and they are doing a fantastic job on their homework um I, I'm, I was just blown away by the lady I talked about. She missed the first two sessions. Um, these are DHS uh, TANF recipients that are in this class. And I, I don't know if they're required or really encouraged or what to attend, but um, she was really hesitant. And everybody, every single person in, in these sessions is just, uh, really engaged, very, per, you know, they participate a lot. We try to make sure and include whatever's in their background. If a, if there's a baby in a playpen, we talk to the baby. If the puppy comes up, try to try to, in, you know, incorporate as many personal things as we can to um, encourage conversation. We're a little bit behind um, where the um, where we're supposed to be as far as in the modules, but not far because. I try to make sure and take a little extra time to, you know, talk to the babies and introduce the kiddos and things like that so that everybody can kind of get to know each other. But we're having great success with it. I'm I'm really encouraged by it. Can't hear you, Ruth. <laughs> Can't hear you. Maureen, what about you? You have your phone line open and you're doing an active class. Yes, I am. I've done two. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great, 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 great. Okay, I've done two classes. I was actually probably four classes in before the coronavirus. So we had that initial where, you know, we were getting to know each other. So, I mean, that was great. 
And then when Corona hit, I was like, oh my gosh, what am I going to do? Because I'm like, I don't know anything about Zoom and I don't know technology wise if these students had the capabilities or the knowledge. So I had taken two weeks off of, you know, just to try to regroup and try to figure out, you know, how to do Zoom. And so I have had the last two classes. I had started with 12, which was a real good class. And I only have four that are participating. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it's going okay, but, um, you know, I'm trying to learn how to share screens and how to, you know, and I'm giving them homework and all this kind of stuff. But, you know, it's, it's, it's a learning thing. So my thing is, is being able to keep them engaged and motivated. So I'm really impressed to hear that there are some people out there that are like, yeah, you know, that's working because I don't know. Uh, Maureen, I, um, uh, were you on our last two weeks? I was. Okay, so you've heard about some of those. Maybe we need to go back to a, uh, another getting ahead. How's it going now that it's been three or four mm -hmm. weeks? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, the weekly call, and yeah. um, and uh, I wanted to say to Kim that we're we're really glad to hear that yours is going well because we know you were worried about that, and Katie Klein chimed in on that too. But I see that Phil Duvall's phone line is open. Let's see what he says. Well, um, I'm really glad to hear that Zoom is going, or those uh, virtual ways of doing getting ahead are working for some people, and it's really encouraging. I thought that uh, the relationship building part would be a bit of a problem. So, you know, inviting the puppies and babies in sounds like part of the solution mm -hmm. there to me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but um, I'm really open to to this idea if as long as we could kind of maintain that the dialogue, the learning from each other, it's the relationships and the learning from each other that is the heart of getting ahead, I think. And if we can do that, that's great because as someone already pointed out, there are people that could be in these groups but can't be for all kinds of reasons, uh, disabilities or children or whatever that is. And this would get more people into getting ahead too. So mm -hmm. um, I think this is a, this whole COVID thing can actually uh, force us to become a bit more innovative. Yeah. yeah. So uh, Maureen, do you know specifically why, or you have speculation about why some of your people dropped? Um, you know what? I think it has to do with um, technology and internet. And I hate to say that's an excuse for them, but um, I have texted them a couple of times and gave them the Zoom invites and whatnot um and they we it's actually there's a group of them that actually and they live within the same vicinity so there's it's like a housing project so it's a community center so they so they all kind of know each other and whatnot um but some of them i think it's just like they're not they're not that motivated i don't know um the four people that i do have are really good um but i couldn't tell you as far as some of them are saying well it's i don't have internet but then there's wi-fi that's available to them so you know it's encouraging that some people are yeah they're sitting in their cars utilizing the wi-fi at at hot spots but these couple of these guys and i don't know if it's just because of everything going on with the, you know them getting their kids was set up for school and stuff like that, so I'm not really sure. Okay. Okay. Any any responses to Maureen about that? Well, that might be coming in on um, the. Um, Jean Krebs says, rural America faces a huge problem with internet accessibility. If there's such a thing as the information superhighway, our farm is an information dirt road. The conversation COVID has brought this forward. So it is an issue. Um, Lori Martin is from Nevada. 
And she says that they uh, created a resource for Nevadans statewide, uh, her nonprofit that she works at, Opportunity Alliance Nevada, has launched a volunteer financial navigator program to connect folks who are struggling with the financial impact of COVID. The link is www.opportunityalliancenevada, I'm sorry, NV, opportunityalliancenv.org, and I'll put that in the chat. Any questions for Lori about that? What's the name of that again? Opportunity. I'm just curious. I want to Google it. Opportunity Alliance NV dot org. Okay. Yeah. Sounds like a pretty cool program for a statewide um, release of that. Okay. All right. So we we usually keep these to about 45 minutes. So does anybody else have a question, a comment? Uh, we want to thank um, Christina for sharing a, a real problem, a real solution. You're very welcome. Thank you. Yeah. And next week, we'll come back um, to some how is uh, getting ahead doing virtual. How is your uh, rollout of getting ahead virtual? Let me say this too. Uh, I know LeVar Glover is on this call and he has connected all of his getting ahead participants using the app called Marco Polo. Oh yeah. In Omaha, they've connected with the app called Band. And Kimberly, uh, what did you say you use? We're using Zoom. At, but not an app, just Zoom? No, just Zoom. Okay. And then I create a group text to just talk to everybody, but for our class, it's actually Zoom. Okay, mm -hmm. I thought somebody else was uh, using an Someone app. Someone said life size. Okay. Life size. I don't remember life who. Size. Um, I think that might have been Alyssa or Ashley. And I want you to know, and I don't know if this works all the time, but when you get cut, cut off on uh, Zoom, the free Zoom, you can, at least I did this, I logged back in using the same credentials and everybody was able to connect again after we all got cut off. So yeah, that know. happened to me too. Um, I told and I told them ahead of time, I said, you know, I'll get like a 10 minute warning. And then I'll say if we get cut off, just log right back in. And it yeah. worked because I was afraid I'd lose people. Oh, good. Yeah. Yeah. It works. So, um, Katie Klein says that you were very inspiring, Christina. Your innovations are inspiring. So, I agree with Katie. But we'll see you all next week at the same time. And, um, and I'll figure out why, what I did, so that we can open up more videos. And uh, we appreciate everybody's time and contributing and being here. So have a good week. I'll post this out on uh, Bridges Facebook so you can share it with your friends as well. Thank you. Thank you, Ruth. Thank you, yeah. everyone.